thinking Ma was some kind of criminal mastermind. <laughs> a real desperate character. Well, she did all right by me and my brothers. But we had rough from the start. Hell, growing up in Oklahoma, we were so poor, we were living in a two-room tall paper shack down by the railroad tracks. It was so crowded, us boys just slept right out there on the bare floor. Now, our daddy took us hunting out in the hills, showed us how to use a rifle. Now, we loved real fast. You might say we got to be real experts with guns. In fact, I often to tell them to show them fellas down at the Ramsey County Jail how to use their new Tommy guns, but they declined my offer. <laughs> <laughs> well, none of us went to school. We just run wild. When we were kids down in Tulsa, me and my brother Fred started our first game. My pals, Bolling Davis and Harry Campbell, were a part of it. We did lots of hijackings and what folks call general banditry. <laughs> but we had lots of pals. You, you needed yeggs you could trust to pull off big jobs. I guess we pulled one job too many. They are calling it the crime of the ages. And that's when our trouble started. Okay, Barker, sit down here. Don't give us any trouble. Court is in session, and the trial may now begin. Mr. Collin. Please, court, counsel, gentlemen and lady of the jury. <laughs> During the next few weeks, the government's going to show that several individuals, including the defendants in this trial, did kidnap and did wrongfully transport in interstate commerce the victim, Edward George Bremer. They did compel Mr. Bremer to sign several notes containing instructions regarding the payment of ransom, ransom in the sum of $200,000. The government will prove that the defendants did conceal and detain and hold the said Edward George Bremer 
in Bensonville, County of DuPage, State of Illinois, from January 17, 1934, until February 7, 1934, a period of 22 days. There will be an eyewitness. The eyewitness will show that this Doc Barker was present at the hideout. And we will also prove that Doc Barker was one of the men that transported, or that was present at the time that, Doc, that Mr. Bremer was kidnapped, and that he also was present at the time that he left the hideout in Illinois. The eyewitness, Byron Bolton, will say that he was watching the defendant at that hideout. There will be other evidence, including a fingerprint found upon a gas can, a fingerprint of the defendant, Doc Barker. The gasoline can was dropped by the defendants near Portage, Wisconsin, during their uh, return back to Minnesota. And finally, the government will prove the payment of ransom $200,000, which itself will establish a clear violation of the Lindbergh Law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Mr. DeCourcy, does the defense wish to make an opening statement? <clears throat> Not at this time. But, Your Honor, Mr. Parker was brought into court in handcuffs, surrounded by some machine gun armed officers. I'd like to call this court's attention to the fact that none of the two gangsters in the hand trial were manacled while they sat in court, and Mr. Parker is kept in handcuffs. He's just a little fellow. A little fellow like that I can handle myself, and yet here he is surrounded by an army. <laughs> and that is prejudicial in the eyes of the jury. Counsel, your argument is prejudicial. <laughs> the court has assumed responsibility for these matters. Sorry, Your Honor. <laughs> Mr. Solomon, you may call your first witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The government calls Mr. Edward G. Bremer. Edward G. Bremer. Please put your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Please be seated. Uh, Mr. Bremer, would you please state your name and your occupation for the record? Edward George Bremer. That's Bremer, not Bremer. I am president of the Commercial State Bank in St. Paul. Mr. Bremer, could you please tell the jury the events that transpired with you on the morning of January 17, 1934? I was driving my daughter Betty to school. Yeah, we call her Herzi. That, that's German, a sweetheart. Uh, that's nice, Mr. Bremer. Just tell us what happened. <laughs> well, we had come to a stop, I had come to a stop at the Lexington Street intersection. Uh, suddenly, the, the passenger side door burst open, and a, and a arm and a gun thrust through. A man said, don't move or I'll shoot. <laughs> well, well, I tried to drive away, but the motor of my Lincoln sedan died. <laughs> I looked ahead, and, and there blocking the way was a, a large black sedan. Well, I, uh, I, I tried to get out of the, the driver's side door, but the door was slammed against my knee. And then I had a blow to the head, and, and blood came pouring down my face, and, I felt dizzy. And then a man came through the door and, and shoved me down into the center of the car. Uh, they covered my eyes with goggles, and, and, and they were taped over so I couldn't see anything. Was anything done to stop the bleeding? Well, it, they gave me a, a, a muffler of some kind, but it, but it was soon saturated with blood. Well, then, then what happened? Well, we, we drove for five or, or ten minutes. Uh, and then I was transferred to another car and, and told that I had been kidnapped. They gave me a, a fountain pen and, and told me to, to sign my name to some notes with typewritten lines. Well, then they asked me who I wanted as a contact man, and I told them Walter McGee. What happened after you signed those notes? Well, we rode on to the, to the hideout. There was some argument about a, a reckless driver, and, and so we stopped to change drivers, and I was given a chicken sandwich. <laughs> We rode on until we stopped, and, uh, and I was led into a house. Well, what happened next? I was led through a door and, and placed in a chair. Uh, they, they washed my head with hot water and put mercurochrome on the cuts. I asked if the cuts were bad, and, 
And they said, well, they could have been worse. <laughs> they said I wouldn't have gotten them if I hadn't put up a fuss. Were you able to tell how many men there were? Four, five, six, seven, eight, I, I don't know. There, there were voices all around, and, and, and I couldn't tell. My eyes were covered. I couldn't see anything. Well, then what happened? Well, they, they, they took the goggles off and put pads over my eyes, uh, then adhesive tape. My ears were stuffed with wet cotton and covered with large pads, uh, and then they, they wrapped my head with gauze, like this. Uh, then they took my coat and my trousers and put me in bed. Please continue. The next night they told me to get out of bed and ordered me to to write some ransom letters. I asked and received permission to write a letter to my wife and my daughter. Did they dictate the notes to you? No, but they told me what to write. Premier, I'm now showing you what has been marked at government exhibits numbers one through five. Are those the notes that you signed while you were in captivity? <coughs> Yes, 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 that's my signature. This one is addressed to my wife. I call her Potts in the salutation. <laughs> it's an affectionate name I have for her. <laughs> uh, well, this one is addressed to Walter McGee. Your Honor, the government offers into evidence uh, government exhibits numbers one through five. <clears throat> no, yes. There being no objection, exhibits one through five are received in evidence. Thank you, Your Honor. What happened next, Mr. Raymer? Well, we, we began a daily routine, which, which began with my waking, waking and uh, being placed in a chair, uh, then washing, and then some breakfast. Were you kept blindfolded at all times? Well, one of my captors informed me that my eyes could be seriously injured by the continuous darkness. So we made a bargain. I said that I would keep my eyes focused strictly ahead and not look around if they would remove the bandages. <laughs> well, did you look around? No, no, I did exactly as I was told. How about they, they, said, they said I would be chained to the bed if I wasn't. Okay, well, how about when the blindfolds were removed? Were you able to make any observations of your surroundings? Well, yes, I, I observed the wallpaper design <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I took note of a table and uh, the corner of a window, the cord of an electric light, uh, and, a, and a crack in the wall across the room. What did they feed you during your captivity? Uh, canned goods, mostly, uh, pork and beans, vegetables, fruit, and heavy syrup. But twice I had steak, and, uh, and once I had the fish. <laughs> Sometimes there was fresh fruit. Once there was fresh strawberry shortcake. <laughs> that was unusual due to the time of year. <laughs> and it is my opinion that a man prepared the food. <laughs> it was always over seasoned. <laughs> Mr. Bremer, what do you recall about when preparations were made for your return to Minnesota? On the morning of February 7, uh, a man came to my bed and said, How would you like to go home? <laughs> well, I could hardly believe it. I said I would. Tell us about the ride home. Well, they forced me to ride behind the front seat of an automobile, all curled up on the floor. Uh, there were two cans in the back that smelled of gasoline. I, I felt the butt of a, of, a, of a rifle or a shotgun against me on the floor. Did they make any stops? About halfway. Uh, the cans were removed from the car, and I heard someone fill the car with gasoline. But then we continued and, until we stopped, and, and I was finally let out. <clears throat> they told me that we were near Rochester, that they had kept their part of the bargain, uh, even though a rival gang had offered them a pile of money if they would turn me over after the ransom had been paid. But uh, because I had kept my word with them, they would do the same by me. Well, finally they left. 
I, I took off the goggles and threw them in an empty lot. I felt wobbly, as we, we hadn't eaten all day. Well, after I felt that I could walk without attracting attention, I, I walked into town where I caught the next train back to St. Paul, uh, where I made my way to my father's house. Well, about a year later, Mr. Bramer, did you return to that home where you had been held in captivity for 22 days? Yes, yes. In January of 1935, uh, with Detective Brennan of the Department of Justice. Were you able to recognize the house? Yes, yes. Certain features of that house were impressed in my mind. I recognized it beyond question as the house where I had been held. I'm showing you now, Mr. Brayer, what has been marked and received in evidence as government exhibit number six. Does that appear to be consistent with the wallpaper that was in the room where you were held? Yes, yes, that looks like it. And when you were present in that house in 1934, Mr. Bramer, was there anything about the bedroom floor that you noticed? Yes, the floor squeaked. <laughs> <laughs> and when you returned in 1935? The floor still squeaked. <laughs> you, Mr. Bramer? I have no further questions. Mr. DeCarcity? I have no questions. Very well. <laughs> Mr. Bramer, you may now step down and you are excused. That Bramer was a constant pain in the ass. <laughs> all he did was complain all day long. Well, his head hurt, his knee hurt, he was cold, he didn't like the food. Uh, we didn't understand what was taking so long for his family to get their ransom money together. Well, they were the richest family in St. Paul. He claimed they only had $25,000 or $30,000 in the bank. Then he tried to make a deal with us. He said we could make more money if we kidnapped someone else. And then he started giving us names of rich people. <laughs> it's like he was trying to pal up to us. He said told us about how he had fenced some stolen bonds and kept asking us if we knew Harry Sawyer. He said to ask Sawyer what a good guy he was. <laughs> what a sucker. It was Harry Sawyer's idea to kidnap her in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> State your name and occupation for the record, please, sir. My name is Adolf Bremer. Uh, I have been in business in St. Paul since uh, 1877. Uh, uh, I am part owner of the uh, Jakob Schmidt Brewing Company. Uh, Mr. Bremer, are you also the father of Edward Bremer? Yes, Eddie, he's my, my eldest son. How did you first learn of the kidnapping? Well, um, <clears throat> Uh, on, on January 17th, 1934, uh, <clears throat> Walter McGee uh, got in touch with us and, and he, he said that, that Eddie, Eddie had been kidnapped and, and that his, his Lincoln sedan was, was in Highland Park somewhere. We, we went to look for it, but, but at first we couldn't find it. What did you do then? Well, we, we kept looking. Finally, we did find it on Edgecombe Road, uh, but Walter, he wouldn't let me go near the car because the, the front seat was all covered with, with blood. And what happened next? Well, we, we drove to Eddie's house to, to tell his wife that her husband had been kidnapped. Well, Mr. Bremer, when did you first receive the ransom notes? A few days later, on, on January 20th, we had been expecting us to hear something, and, and on that day, Dr. Nipper came. Uh, he came to the house uh, around noon, uh, and he brought some notes with him. He said they had been in a milk bottle that was thrown through his front, front door. Mr. Bremer, I'm handing you now what has been received in evidence as government exhibits numbers one and two. Are those 
the notes that were delivered uh, to your home by Dr. Nipper? Y yes, these are the notes, yes. Would you, would you please uh, read them to the jury? Yes. Uh, <coughs> this first one is, is addressed uh, to Eddie's wife. Um, uh, dearest Potts, please don't worry. I hope everything will come out all right. T tell Hertie to be a good little girl. Her, her daddy is thinking of her all the time, and to see you and her again is all that I want. I suppose you're worrying about the blood in the car. I have a cut on my head which, which bled a lot, but it has been dressed and it is all right now. I'm treated nice, and the only thing I have to ask is that you, you keep the police out of this so that I am returned safely. Ed. Thank you. Now, could you please read the second one? This one is to Walter W. McGee. I'm sorry to have called on you, but I felt that you were the old standby. I want to ask that you work all alone on this, no police. I know you will do this for me. Please work all alone, no strings attached, as I'm sure that everything will come out all right. And it's signed, Ed Brick. Mr. Bremer, what arrangements did you make to come up with a ransom money? My brother Otto and I, we, we went to the American National Bank uh, and we signed notes for the money. Uh, uh, Otto is, is president of the bank. How long was it between the time that the money was at the bank until it was transferred to your home? Uh, 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 about uh, two weeks, February 4th, uh, around midnight. Mr. Bremer, could you please describe the condition of Eddie on the night of his return? Oh, oh he, he looked like a wild man. He, he, he couldn't stand up, and, and, and he, was, he was so sick, and, and his, his face was, was all drawn, and he looked just terrible, just terrible. What did he say? He said... He, he thought, I thought he was out of his head. I mean, he, he, he kept saying that, that uh, no one could know that he was home because uh, it couldn't be in the morning newspaper. We wanted him to go to bed, and, and, uh, but he was so nervous that he, he said he couldn't sleep. And, and oh, he looked so tired. I've, I've never seen a man look so, so bad. Thank you, Mr. Bramer. I, I have no further questions. Mr. DeCarsi? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bramer, thank you for appearing here today. You may step down. Thank you. Mr. <laughs> Solomon, you may call your next witness. The government calls Walter McGee. Walter McGee. Please put your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Please be seated. Mr. McGee, would you please state your name and your occupation? Walter McGee. I'm currently a director of the Commercial State Bank of St. Paul, uh, where Edward Bramer is president. I've been a friend of the Bramer family for many years. Mr. McGee, when did you get your first information pertaining to the kidnapping? About 10, 20 in the morning on January 17th, I got a call at my office. I was told that I was in a tough spot, that they'd snatched Ed Bramer. I was told to follow a note, uh, instructions on a note that was left under the back steps behind my office. Any of you would have been received in evidence as exhibit number three, Mr. McGee. Is that the note that was received at your office? Yes, it is. Please read it to the jury. You are hereby declared in on a very desperate undertaking. Don't try to cross us. Your friend isn't none too comfortable right now. So don't delay the payment. 
We demand $200,000 in five and $10 bills, no new money, no consecutive numbers. Place the money in two large suit box cartons. When you are ready to pay, place an ad in the Minneapolis Tribune under a personal column reading, We Are Ready Alice. You will then receive your final instructions. Don't try to stall or outsmart us. Don't try to bargain, don't plead poverty. We know how much they have in their banks. Threats aren't necessary. You just do your part. We guarantee to do ours. Police have never helped in such a spot and they won't this time either. You better take care of the payout first and let them do the detecting later. And what did you do? First thing I did was call the chief of police, Thomas Damon. <laughs> <laughs> what arrangements did you make to, to get the money? Took me several days to arrange to get the money, but then I couldn't even get to it because of a time lock in the American National Bank at St. Paul. What happened next? Then I received another note that had been delivered to Father John Deere, a Catholic priest and a friend of the Bramer family. And you now what has been marked as government exhibit number four and received into evidence. Is that the note that was received by Father Deere? Oh, yes. Read that to the jury, please. Walter McGee or Honest Adolph, the coppers <laughs> jimmed the last payoff. Maybe you was in on it, maybe not. We give you one more rattle. No more assurance, though, that he's alive until we are assurance that we get the dough. Thieves are not so foxy as bankers, but they're usually more <clears throat> honorable. <laughs> get the dough and stay ready all the time. You will hear soon from us, but be ready to leave at once. It's this time or never. How did you get the money? Mr. Smith at the American National Bank got some of the small bills from his bank, and then we got the rest from the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis. There were 20 packages of bills totaling $200,000. I put four girls from our bank working on listing the serial numbers for each bill and took them all day. Then we had to put four more girls on it and they finished the job about midnight. What happened next? Then I received another note. Oh, I'm handing you what has been received in evidence as exhibit number five. Is that the next note you received? Yes. Please read that one to the jury. When you are ready to meet our terms, place a National Recovery Act sticker in the center of each of your office windows. We will know if coppers are pulled off or not. Remain at your office daily from noon until 8 p.m. If Chief Dayhill is so hot to meet us, you can send him with the dough. We will be ready for any trickery if attempted. This is positively our last attempt. Don't duck it. Did you receive any further instructions regarding the delivery? Yes, on February 6th under new instructions from the kidnappers. I drove in a circuitous route to 969 University Avenue to look for a Chevrolet Coupe with shell gas signs on each door. I put the two suit boxes of money into the car and I found the keys in the left-hand door pocket along with a note. The note read, either you get him back tonight or the coppers get him back stiff. Did you notice anything else in that car? I saw some kind of cap in there but it was kind of dark and I wasn't really paying attention to that. I'm showing you now what has been received in evidence is government exhibit number seven, Mr. McGee. Does that appear to be the hat that was being worn that you saw in the car? This resembles the cap, yes. What did you do after that? I drove the car down to Farmington and <coughs> as instructed, I followed a bus till I saw four red lights on the side of the road out by Zombroda. Then I continued driving until the car behind me flashed its headlights five times. Now that was the signal. So I got out on the side of the road and left the boxes of money there. And what happened next? I hopped back in the car and drove back to St. Paul and turned the car over to the Department of Justice. Did you ever return along that same route? Yes, I had to go out there the next morning again with Chief Dayhill. Uh, we looked around and found a flashlight out there. Showing you now, Mr. McGee, what has been marked as government exhibit number eight. Is that the, one of the flashlights that you found by the side of the road? That looks like a flashlight, yes. Now the government offers into evidence exhibit eight. Your Honor, I object. How do we know that's the same flashlight? How can the witness identify that as the identical flashlight? Your Honor, this is the identical flashlight that was found by Chief Dayhill. It was sent to Washington to be checked for fingerprints and then returned here to St. Paul for the trial. But how do we know that that's the same identical flashlight? The objection is sustained. Sustained. 
<laughs> Mr. McGee, is this flashlight identical in appearance to the flashlight that you found on the side of the road? In appearance, yes. Thank you, Mr. McGee, your witness counsel. Mr. McGee, after delivery of the ransom money, when did you return? About one o'clock in the morning. I have no further questions. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. McGee, if you may step down in our queue. And Mr. Solomon, you may call your next witness. The government calls Mrs. Florence Humphrey. Mrs. Florence Humphrey. your left hand in the Bible. Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it? I do. Please be seated. Ms. Humphrey, could you please state your name and your occupation for the record? My name is Florence Humphrey. I am a clerk at the F&W Grand Silver Hardware Store at 67 West 7th Street in St. Paul. Mrs. Humphrey, could you tell us about uh, an event that happened at the store on January 27, 1934? Yes. Late that morning, a man came into the hardware store and went right to the electrical department. That's where I work. He wanted to buy three flashlights. I sold him two black ones and a box type. Can you describe this man? Well, he, he wore a dark brown uniform, kind of like what chauffeurs wear. <laughs> and he had tall riding boots and a, and a blue cap. Showing you what has been received in evidence as government exhibit number seven, Mrs. Humphrey. Is that consistent with the hat that the man was wearing? That's the hat he wore. What else did this man have to say? Well, he was kind of the nervous type. He had a nervous disposition, kind of like he was trying to get away. <laughs> Did he say why he wanted to buy three large flashlights? Well, I asked him just that. He said he was going to go out into the woods. <laughs> Uh, exhibit number eight. Is that the flashlight that you sold to this man? That's the kind we carry in the store, and that's the kind I sold that man that day. Thank you. Your Honor, the government reoffers exhibit number eight. Same objection. Still sustained. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Hump, what was it about that event which makes it so memorable for you today? Well, he wanted to make sure they worked, not how much they cost. How long did this man remain in your store? Oh, I think only about five minutes. How close were you standing to him while he was there? He was right beside me. Humphrey, I am now showing you what has been received in evidence as government exhibit number 58. Can you identify the man in that photograph? That's the man. Your Honor, let the record reflect that Mrs. Humphrey has identified as the customer in the store, public enemy number one, Alvin Carpus. All right, the record will so reflect. Thank you. Your witness, counsel. Uh, 
Ms. Humphrey, when were you first shown the photograph that Mr. Sullivan just handed to you? Oh, it was about a month and a half later. About a month and a half. Is it possible to remember a person after a month and a half, what they looked like, how they were dressed? I never forget a face once I've seen it. Is it possible for you to remember every single customer? Well, when it's so unusual, I do. He bought three flashlights. <laughs> I'm finished with this witness. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Hoover, but Carpus was a real brains in our outfit. He met my brother Fred in the Kansas State pen, and those two were like peas in a pod. <laughs> when they got out, we all went on what you might call a bank robbing spree. <laughs> Carpus, super smart. Well, he planned every job right down to the last detail. The standard procedure was to pick a bank, then we'd run the roads all around till we knew every highway, dirt road, and gravel track so we could make our escape. We hid cans full of gasoline here and there in case copper shot our gas tanks. And uh, if they were chasing us, we'd throw roof and nails out the back windows of our getaway car. <laughs> now that was a sight to see. All them cop cars stopped cold by flat tires. <laughs> now, we ended up in St. Paul because we knew the coppers would leave us alone so long as we made a donation to the police for <laughs> Carver said the cop, uh, that the crooks in St. Paul outnumbered the uh, doctors even 20 to 1. <laughs> now in between jobs, we like to relax up at Harry Sawyer's farm out there on Sucker Lake. He and his wife Gladys have a real nice place. Or we loosen up at uh, Sawyer's Saloon, the Green Lantern Saloon out there on Wabasha Street. It was like a never-ending party. <laughs> There were so many safe crackers and bank robbers hanging around there, Carpus called his personal headquarters. <laughs> now, cops call him old creepy Carpus because they think it's creepy how he seems to vanish after a job. Carpus is just real careful. He's always after us to make sure we don't leave no fingerprints behind. Sir, could you please state your name and your occupation? <laughs> Reuben Grossman. I farm about six miles out of Portage, Wisconsin. And my farm's at the end of a blind township road off of Highway 16. Excuse me, Mr. Grossman. I must ask you to remove your hat in this courtroom. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Your Honor. It's record setting cold out there today. It was only 18 degrees when I went down to milk the cows this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Grossman. January 7, 1934. Remember that date? Yes, I do, sir. Right. Now, on that day, did you see a particular automobile going down a road near your farm? Well, yes, I did. I saw an automobile pass by that afternoon, about 4 o'clock. Okay, and where were you located when you saw that car? Well, I was down by the sorghum mill, east of the road. I was unhitching my uh, team of horses there. And the distance from the sorghum mill to the road? About a rod. How far is a rod? A rod? Oh, 16 and a half feet for you city folks. <laughs> <laughs> what can you describe this car? Yes, there's a big black one. Five, seven passengers probably. Where did you next see the car? On my uh, neighbor's road. Yeah. I was standing on the knoll by the barn, and I saw two men get out of the car. Could you see what the men were doing? Well, they were standing around the back of the car. One was standing up, the other was kind of crouching down. But I can't say that I actually seen what they were doing. And when did you next see the car? Uh, about 15 minutes later, passed by on the way out to uh, Highway 16. Did you do any follow-up after that? Well, later in the day, I was curious, so I went down where I'd seen the car, 
you know, it was about three quarters of a mile off the road, and I seen where the tracks were there in the snow. And that's when I saw the gas cans, four gas cans. And they looked pretty good. I figured they could be, you know, I could use them, so I took them home with me. <laughs> <laughs> this appear to be one of those gasoline cans that you yeah, it does, it does, looks like it. Did you speak to anybody about the gas cans? Well, about four days later, Deputy Sheriff showed up. What did he do? Well, he asked about the car, and he asked me to take him down where I'd seen the car. He saw, uh, saw the tracks, and uh, then he, uh, he took the gas cans. Uh, somebody told me later they sent him down to St. Paul. I never got him back, sir. I never did. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Grossman. No further questions. Mr. Grossman, did anyone else handle the cans? No, no one that I know of. Were there any markings on the cans? None. But well, one was red, just like that one. I think that's it. <laughs> I'm done with this witness. Huh? You're excused, Mr. Grossman. Thank you for appearing here. Thank you, Your Honor. to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Please be seated. <laughs> Mr. Cohen, I'd like to have you please state your name and your occupation for the record. My name is Aaron Cohn. I'm a fingerprint expert from Washington, D.C., working for the Bureau of Investigation of the United States Department of Justice. Now, is it true, Mr. Cohn? Is it true that you were asked to do some fingerprint comparisons for purposes of this trial? Yes, I examined a latent fingerprint taken from a gasoline can and compared it to one from the Barker file at the Bureau office, specifically a, a fingerprint taken from Arthur Doc Barker when he was incarcerated in the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in 1923. Well, Mr. Cohen, fingerprints were taken from Doc Barker at the time of his recent arrest in Chicago. Why didn't you use those more recent prints for comparison purposes? Because those prints were <clears throat> unusual. Unusual? In what way? Well, I know that apparently an attempt had been made to take a, a surface of the fingerprint and actually try to remove or somehow... I, I, I object. I object. The witness may answer. <laughs> Approximately a quarter of an inch of the ridges of the fingerprint had been marred. Mr. Cohen, could you please describe to the jury this process of fingerprint identification? Yes, the hands are covered with a series of friction ridges containing sweat pores. Now, these complex ridges have many characteristic formations. What is a latent fingerprint? A latent fingerprint is left by perspiration containing oily or fatty matter and is not readily apparent to the naked eye. Mr. did you yourself find and locate and remove the fingerprint from this gasoline can? Yes. Please tell us how you did that. Well, the process is simple. I, uh, first of all, coated the exterior of the area of the can with a very fine dragon's blood fingerprint powder, which adheres to the oily or fatty matter. I then coated the area of the fingerprint with a thin layer of shellac to preserve it, and finally I photographed. Well, was it a clear print? No, oh, yes, it was. <laughs> now, I understand, uh, Mr. Cohen, that you have made transparencies from these fingerprints for purposes of display? Yes. Your Honor, the government has provided defense counsel with copies of these transparencies, and at this time, we would offer them into evidence. I object. Why did the witness make transparencies? Why not just regular photographs? 
photographs. Oh, because regular photographs would have served no purpose whatsoever. Nobody can see through prints made on paper. Oh, these double transparent scenes will establish beyond a shadow of a doubt that the two fingerprints came from the same right index finger. The objection is overruled. The exhibits are admitted. Mr. Cole, please continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, if I may direct, direct the jury's attention to the screen above. The first slide will show a copy of the fingerprint removed from the gasoline can. Now, for comparison purposes, the next slide, please. The next slide contains a copy of the fingerprint from Arthur Doc Barker's 1923 penitentiary file. And now, if we superimpose the two images over each other, next slide, please, you will see that the two fingerprints match up exactly. Well, is it possible, Mr. Cohn, that somebody else's fingerprint, if transposed and uh, superimposed upon uh, Doc Barker's, would also coincide? It is not possible whatsoever. Not one of the fingerprints on file at the U.S. Department of Justice is even similar to the one taken from the gasoline can. If two fingerprints have six similar points, the odds are 48 times the population of the Earth to one that they came from the same finger. If two fingerprints have eight similar points, the odds are two million times the population of the Earth to one that they came from the same finger. All 14 points on the two fingerprints match up exactly. I would give a, um, a mathematical wizard the opportunity to determine the uh, statistical probabilities of 14 identical points. Your Honor, I object to the witness calling the fingerprint on the Can Barker's fingerprint. It was February. Overruled. Well, Mr. Cohn, is there anything about cold weather like we have in February which would prevent a fingerprint from being left? But in cold weather, a, a normal person would not leave much in the way of print. Uh, the cold would cause the skin to contract and the pores to close, and therefore not leave much oily or fatty matter with which to make a print. Well, then how would it be possible for a print to be left in cold weather? A person under the stress of nervous excitement such as a criminal during the commission of a crime, would perspire more. The sweat glands would continue to exude moisture and therefore leave a very distinct, latent print. I object. That's prejudicial. Overruled. <clears throat> well, Mr. Cohen, then in your expert opinion, do the fingerprints in this case and the transparencies you have used provide a positive identification? It is absolutely positive identification. The fingerprint that came from the gasoline can is that of Arthur Doc Barker. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Your witness, Mr. DeCarsi. <clears throat> Mr. Cohn, are you sufficiently familiar with photography to know that there are certain tricks about it? I have heard that that is the case, but I don't know any photographic tricks. Mr. Cohen, how many individual prints are there on file in the Department of Justice? Oh, there are some five million sets of prints, totaling 50 million individual prints. <laughs> 50 million individual prints? Seems to me like there might be some room for error. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, for crying out loud. I was pouring gas in the tank, and my glove got soaked, so I took it off. Well, Carpenter yelled at me on account we didn't want to leave no fingerprints, but I didn't care. Hell, we were out in the middle of nowhere. What other chance is some old geezer's going to come find no gas cans? <laughs> well, that's what got me thinking about how to solve that fingerprint problem. Uh, young man, uh, please state your name and your occupation. James Wilson. I, w I was a college student at Northwestern University. And how old are you, Mr. Wilson? I'm 27 years old. You'll have to speak up, please. Yes, sir. It's, it's just that I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> you are afraid? Afraid to testify? Well, I'm not afraid for myself, but I am afraid for my mother and my father and my sister. And you're afraid of Doc Barker or the other gangsters? Well, I'm not afraid of Doc Barker because of the position that he's in. But if I was on the outside, I'd say yes. I've, I've been reading in the newspaper just about how desperate these men are. Well, I heard they erased my boss, Dr. Moran, because he was chiseling on the ransom money. 
Well, afraid or not, you're going to have to tell the truth, son, because you swore to do that on a Bible. Yes, sir. <laughs> Please continue, Mr. Saul. Well, Mr. Wilson, how did you come to be, happen to be working for Dr. Joseph Patrick Moran? Well, he heard about my desire to study medicine, and he promised me that if I went to work for him, he would send me through medical school. What type of work did you do? Mostly. I was just his chauffeur and attendant at the office he had next to the Irving Hotel where he lived. Tell us about an event that you witnessed in room 211 of the Irving Hotel. Well, I saw two men there with Dr. Moran, and they were counting out a stack of money that they had piled on the bed. How long did you remain? I didn't remain at all. I left immediately, I swear. <laughs> Later, when I asked Dr. Moran about it, he said, I got a deal going on. I'm going to see that you go to medical school. Now mind your own business. Did you ever ask Dr. Moran about his business? No. He was very secretive about it. Now, did you have any idea where this money on the bed might have come from? No, not at all. I think I heard that it might have been hot money because I thought I heard one of the men telling Dr. Moran to change the money into, into cool dough. What was meant by that one? I, I don't know. Now, Mr. Wilson, do you recall a certain medical procedure done by Dr. Moran upon two men there in the Irving Hotel? M medical procedure? The fingertip procedure, Mr. Wilson. Do you recall that one? Yes, I do. And do you remember the two men upon whom that was performed? Well, I know now, but I didn't know then. Well, one was called Slim, and he, he was Alvin Carpus. And, and the other was called Doc, and, and, he, was, and he was Doc Barker. Uh, but I didn't know that then, I, I swear. Dr. Moran told me they were just a couple of small town gangsters. <laughs> How did you come to witness this event, Mr. Wilson? Well, it was in the middle of May 1934, and Dr. Moran called and told me to bring his surgical bag up to room 234. When I got there, there were two men laying in the bed, and they had one hand outside the covers. One of the, one of the men asked about me, and Dr. Moran said that I was all right, and I was from his office. Dr. Moran had been drinking again. He, he drinks a lot. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he said, all ready? Better make yourself useful. Well, what did he mean by that remark? Well, he was going to perform surgery on them, and he wanted me to bandage them. Now, I said that I didn't want to because it was against the law. But then Dr. Moran told me that there's no law against performing any procedure on the human body, except for gunshot wounds, and that doctors advertise plastic surgery all the time, and it was not against the law. Well, after that, I, I told him I'd help him. What happened next? Well, they stayed for about a week, and then Dr. Moran asked me to drive Doc Barker to Toledo. Why was it necessary for you to drive him to Toledo? His hands were, uh, they, they were inca incapacitated. Where did you live when you were in Toledo? We lived with Doc's brother, Freddie Barker, and, and, his, and his girlfriend, Paula Harmon. Oh yeah, Winona Burdett was there too. Now, Mr. Wilson, did Dr. Moran uh, pay you for the assistance you provided in this fingertip removal procedure? I was supposed to get $1,000, but, but I only got about 100 of it, and I had to buy gauze and medical supply out of that money, too. Mr. Wilson, did you just do whatever it was that Dr. Moran told you to do? Yes, I was working for him. Didn't you have any judgment of your own? Yes, I probably did. I probably just let Dr. Moran do my thinking for me. But he was my ideal. He was going to send me through medical school. OK, I, I guess you could say that the fingerprint operation wasn't one of our better ideas. <laughs> Carpenter's asked around Chicago about Dr. Moran. Me and Carpenter thought it was going to be easy, like chomping in a pencil. Well, the doctor gave us morphine and whiskey and tied rubber bands around our fingers and started slicing away. When the drugs wore off, that's when the pain kicked in. 
That was the worst pain I have ever felt. It hurt so bad I asked that Jimmy kid to shoot me in the head. <laughs> and while he was at it, that, that drunk doctor, well, he did a little work on our faces. Well, he said he knew what he was doing, but all I know is I ain't no Gary Cooper now. <laughs> We were sitting around all bandaged up when we found out our pal George Ziegler got shot dead in Cicero. And he was coming out of some minding his own business. A car drove by and somebody shot his face off. And when Ma saw us with the bandages, she said, Jesus Christ, were you with George Ziegler? <coughs> and we told her, no, we've been in a car wreck. <laughs> Ma knew better than ask questions. Ma'am, would you please state your name, your occupation, and your current address? My name is Winona Burdett. I was a blues singer in nightclubs and on the radio, but now I live at the My Land Michigan Women's Penitentiary. And why are you currently living in a women's penitentiary? For Harbor and Alvin Carpus in Florida. Ms. Burdett, in the latter part of 1933, were you here in St. Paul? Yes. Well, sometime in November. Me and my man, Harry Campbell, were coming from Reno, and when we got here, we stayed out at Harry Sawyer's place. Later, we got a furnished apartment in St. Paul. What, January 13, 1934? Tell us about that day. Oh, it was my 22nd birthday, and Paula Harmon and Freddie Barker gave me a party at their apartment on Grand Avenue. Oh, and Doc Barker and Harry Campbell were also there. Oh, we stayed up all night. Well, after you stayed up all night, Miss Burnett, <laughs> uh, did anybody leave the next day? Oh, Freddie and Harry left about 9 in the morning. They said they'd see us in a couple of days. When did you next see Fred? Well, I saw him the day he left St. Paul, a few days later on the 16th. He came and asked me to bake a chicken, and I said I would, and I did. Well, later that day, about four in the afternoon, he came and took the chicken and went away. <laughs> well, what did Fred do after he took your chicken? Well, we stayed at the apartment until he came about noon the next day and said for us to get busy because we were moving to Chicago. So me and Paula got our things together and started for Chicago that afternoon and stayed at Edna Murray's flat. Well, while you were in Chicago, did you see Fred's brother, Doc Parker? Yes. Well, he came alone. We talked. But he didn't say anything about business. How long did you remain in Chicago? Well, I stayed there until I went to Toledo about the middle of February. Well, when you got to Toledo, did you see any of your uh, St. Paul friends? Uh, yes, in May I saw Alvin Carpus and Freddie Barker. <clears throat> How about Doc Barker? Well, yes, he lived with us for about a month. And did you have any other visitors there at your place in Toledo? Uh, Jimmy Wilson and Dr. Moran. Ms. Burnett, do you remember a, a clinical procedure done by Dr. Moran on one of the residents in your home there in Toledo? Yes. Who was it that was the resident that had had a procedure performed upon him by Dr. Moran? Doc Barker. And what was the procedure that had been performed? Well, I don't know. I just saw his hands wrapped up. Did you take care of Doc Barker? Well, yes, I had to feed him when Jimmy wasn't around. Thank you, Miss Burnett. Your witness, Mr. Carson. No cross-examination. <laughs> <laughs> Very well, ma'am, you are excused and may step down.
government calls Miss Betty Bearwall. Miss Betty Bearwall. <laughs> please put your left hand on the Bible. Your left hand, please. Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you, God? Oh, yes, yes, I do. I do. Please be seated. <laughs> Miss Bearwald, please state your full name. My name is Elizabeth Bearwald, but my friends call me Betty. Miss Bearwald, where were you employed from July of 1933 until May of 1934? I worked as a maid for Harry Sawyer out at his farm near Rice Street and Snail Lake Road. Did you do any work for Harry Sawyer at places other than at his farm? Occasionally, he had me do some cleaning at his <clears throat> nightclub, Green Lantern in St. Paul. He had such goings on there, drinking, drugs, even naked women, dancing on the tables. Let's uh, talk about the farm. Uh, <laughs> Were there any frequent visitors out at the Harry Sawyer farm? Oh, yes. A man named Freddie was a frequent visitor. Sure, well, I'm showing you a photograph which has been received in ev evidence as exhibit number 59. Can you identify that man? That sure looks like Freddie. Your Honor, let the record reflect that the witness has identified as the frequent visitor that bloodthirsty killer, Fred Barker, <laughs> the brother, the deceased brother of the defendant, Doc Barker. I object, Your Honor. That's completely prejudicial language. Mr. Salva, please save your hyperbole for your summation to the jury. But I will allow the record to reflect that the man in the photo is, in fact, Fred Barker. Thank you, Your Honor. Spare off hope. Often did Fred Barker come out to the farm during the autumn of 1933? Mm, about a half a dozen times. How about around Christmas of 33? Did you see him at that time? Oh, yes. He brought a woman called Paula, and I remember because he said she had to stay for Christmas dinner. Did Fred ever bring his mother, Kate Barker, out to the farm? Oh yes, that was before the Christmas dinner in October or November of 1933. Freddie brought her out that one time. She was a real sick old lady. A nurse came out and brought her some cough medicine. She was just an old-fashioned homebody. Every, everybody called her Ma. Sometimes she would get lonesome, and that made her really cantankerous. And so I would help her with her jigsaw puzzles to keep her company. She sure didn't like that Paula woman. And she kept saying how Paula was ruining her sweet boy Fred. Now, is there something else about Ma Barker that you could tell us? Oh, she liked to listen to Amos and Andy and Hillbilly music on the radio. They brought violin cases in with them, but I never saw them playing any instruments. <laughs> The guns, Miss Bearwald, the guns. Didn't you see Ma Barker carrying a gun? No, sir. Miss Bearwald, certainly you realized that these people were gangsters. No, sir. I had no idea they were part of that Barker Carpus gang. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Bearwald. New witness, counsel. <clears throat> now, uh, Miss Bearwold, in what direction was the Sawyer home from St. Paul? About five or six miles out Rice Street. But don't you know that Harry Sawyer lived on Jefferson Avenue in St. Paul? Not while I was working for him. Uh -huh. No further questions. <laughs> <laughs> we took Ma with us whenever we were on the move. Well, she couldn't fend for herself, and besides, she was a good cop. She told people we were traveling musicians on account of them violin cases we carried around. <laughs> Only I, 
There weren't no violins in them cases. They was just the right size to carry around a Thompson submachine gun. Now, Ma never took part in any of the actual robberies. But sure, she knew her boys were criminals, but she never wanted to know any details. When we sat down to plan a bank job, we sent her off to the movies. Ma saw a lot of movies. <laughs> <laughs> and we would stay out at Harry Sawyer's farm. Whenever the heat was on in town, we needed to lay low for a while. And it was way out in the country. And we liked it up there, especially around White Bear Lake. There's good fishing, and we could meet up with our pals and uh, let loose, maybe uh, have a little fun out of the plantation nightclub. <laughs> and we was up at Harris Sawyer's. We was tossing around ideas for our next job. Now, Harris Sawyer had some kind of a grudge against Bremer, so he put the finger on him since he knew his family had lots of dough, well, with the bank and the brewery. Now, Carpus wanted us just to rob a bank. But uh, Sawyer was dead set on the kidnapping because he said that it was less risky and the payoff was better. So, Carpers was outvoted. That's when all our troubles began. Maybe we just got too greedy. State your name for the record. Byron Bolton. Bolton, it's true, is it not, that you have pleaded guilty to the crime of conspiracy in the kidnapping of Edward Bramer? Yeah. Mr. Bolton, when did you first hear of this kidnapping plot? Well, I was in Chicago and I got a call from George Ziegler. He asked me if I would take care of his house for him as they wanted to kidnap some guy out of St. Paul. He said he was no good and they wanted to send him away. What did you tell Zeke? Well, I told him I didn't want nothing to do with it. When did you next speak to Zeke? Well, that was the evening of January 18th at his apartment. He told me they'd gone and kidnapped that Bremer guy. Did he tell you who had done the actual kidnapping itself? Oh, yeah. What Ziegler told me was that he and Bonnie Davis and Fred Barker were in a car about a block away. It was Doc Parker and Al Carpus who did the actual snatching. After speaking to Ziegler, did you go to that uh, hideout in Bensonville, Illinois? Sure. I brought him some groceries, some booze, copy of the Chicago Tribune. Uh, Al Carpus, he let me in. They were real eager to read the newspaper story about the kidnapping. Okay. Who else did you see at the hideout? Uh, Doc Barker, uh, Bill Weaver, some other guy. How long, how many times did you go there? Well, you know, over those three weeks, I was there, I don't know, a few times. What else did you observe? Guns. They had a lot of guns. I, one room, they had like four or five machine guns just sitting that, right there on the day bed. Did you ever see Edward Bremer at the, at the height? Well, once I went by his room and I, I saw the guy just sitting there. He was just sitting with his head all bandaged up. <clears throat> you know, when he had to go to the bathroom, this Bremer guy, he had to shout out for his guys. And they would answer real soft-like to make sure that he couldn't hear, to make sure that his ears were still stuffed with the cotton or something. And then they got louder. Yeah, that poor bastard. <coughs> what else did you observe? Well, you know, during the last week, uh, they all got real anxious. And they argued amongst themselves a lot. Yeah, I brought out these four cans of gasoline. I saw them put those in the car. What did you do then? Well, I was waiting around. And I saw Bremer come out of the house with Doc Barker. Now, Bremer had something on his face, something on his eye, you know, goggles or something. Uh, so Doc Barker had to help him out to the car. Did you go with him? Oh, no, no. Nah. Me and Boldy Davis and Fred Barker, we went to this apartment where they brought in these two big suit boxes. And Fred Barker, he throws them down right there on the Davenport and says, there, there's the dough. We sure had a hard time getting it. Well, what happened next? Well, it was agreed that we would get together the next day to split up the money. After the other boys, they got back from St. Paul. Then what did you do? Well, I left Chicago that night, and I went to Phoenix, Arizona. I stayed there for a couple of months. On account of, well, you know, I got the, the TB. <coughs> Mr. Bolton, this man that you have spoken about as Doc Parker, can you identify him in the courtroom today? Yeah. That's him. 
Thank you, Mr. Bolton. Your witness, Mr. DeCarsey. Mr. Bolton, uh, what is your business? I'm a gambler. What kind of gambling? <laughs> I had about 15 slot machines. How do you make your money to gamble? I played golf. <laughs> <laughs> What's your average score? I average about 75. Mr. Bolton, were you ever convicted of a crime? No. Wasn't it you and Ziegler who got Kramer out of the house that morning? No, it wasn't. Mr. Bolton, you're a war veteran, aren't you? Yeah, I am. In fact, weren't you known as Machine Gun Bolton? <laughs> nah, never heard that name. <laughs> Mr. Bolton, were you offered any consideration by the government in exchange for your testimony? No. I just felt sorry for that Bremer guy. Liar. <laughs> <laughs> that dirty rat. Bolton made a deal with the feds and sang like a canary. He and George Ziegler were in on what the papers call the Valentine's Day Massacre in Chicago. You might have heard about that. Yeah. Well, he was our gang's Tommy man. Handy with a machine gun. And when we all got caught, he turned to state's evidence to save his own sorry ass. <laughs> you know, after the Bremer snatch, we got turned away every place we tried to go with that dough. And then after Ziegler got hit, and we knew Chicago was too hot. But we moved to Toledo. And Ma wanted to come along, but for once we told her no, she had to stay. She put up a fuss, but we got her a nice apartment. Then about six months later, my brother Fred took Ma down to Florida, and they found a nice cottage on a lake. Well, me and Carpus and, and that rat Bolton, we took our gals down there for a little visit. And we had us a nice, right good old time, fishing and alligator hunting. <laughs> Fred even got a pig, and we towed it behind the boat all day long with our rifles ready. That old Joe Gator never took the bait. <laughs> when we had to get back to Chicago, I, I was afraid that I wouldn't remember the name of that late place when it came time to, to contact Fred for our next job. So I, I circled it on a road map and put it in my suitcase. About a week later, I'm coming out of my gal's place one night, and I care in the world. Suddenly, I'm surrounded by a bunch of fellas yelling, stick them up, we're federal agents. Well, as they're hauling me away, all I could think of was, this is a hell of a time to be without a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Feds found that map in my suitcase. Went on down to that lake house. Shot up my family, all to pieces. Mm. Well, they never had a chance. Hey, police court, counsel, lady and gentlemen of the jury, the kidnapping of Edward Bremer was not the crime of the century, it was the crime of the ages. For every day that Edward Bremer experienced anguish and agony, Somebody ought to be made to suffer. And I think you know who it is. The ancient Hebrews knew what to do with kidnappers. Here, the Holy Bible, 24th chapter of Deuteronomy, the seventh verse, says, Whosoever shall steal his brother, make merchandise of him, and sell him, that thief shall die. Kidnappers, in this case, stole Edward Bremer. They made of him human merchandise, and they sold him for $200,000. They did those things with forethought, and they did them with malice. In September of 1933, some of the most dangerous and notorious criminals in all of American history gathered right here in St. Paul and conspired to steal Edward Bremer. But 
even after they sold him for $200,000, his suffering didn't end. He will remember those 22 days of torture for the rest of his life, and for that, someone must be made to pay, and I believe you know who it is. Now, the kidnappers did not act alone. They had helpers in the commission of this crime. Kidnappers are like the lions in a jungle. They make the kill. Always surrounding them in the shadows are the jackals waiting for their share. Jackals like Byron Bolton, Jimmy Wilson. Now, I hold no brief for Byron Bolton, but that man does deserve some credit. By his testimony in this case, he showed some willingness to make amends for the wrongs that he has done, indicating that there is still a spark of manhood in that blackened heart. <laughs> As for Jimmy Wilson, young lad, he must be stopped to prevent his own self-destruction. You can't let Jimmy Wilson go if he is to be saved. Doc Barker? Doc Barker is a stark mad dog. <laughs> what kind of a madman would hold an innocent person in captivity in a tiny bedroom for 22 days, torturing him all that time? while torturing his loved ones and his family by telling them that he would return to them their son and their father stiff if they did not pay up. What sort of a madman would endure the agony of having his fingertips sliced off and acid poured on those fingertips by Dr. Joseph Moran in a futile attempt to conceal his identity from the law. The fact that Doc Barker was willing to mutilate his own body in that manner is evidence of a conscience of guilt. And where do we find Doc Barker? Always with the other conspirators in St. Paul, in Chicago, in Bensonville, in Toledo, always on the run always being chased by his own guilty conscience. Members of the jury, the evidence in this case is undisputed. He put up no defense. <laughs> I don't know how you can return any verdict in this case except guilty against Doc Barker. Guilty. Guilty. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Mr. DeCarcy, do you wish to make a summation? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Throughout this trial, government testimony has barely touched upon my client, Arthur Barker. Only the testimony of other defendants and the testimony of Byron Bolton could apply directly against my client. The vicarious secondhand statements of other defendants should be held against Mr. Barker. And the testimony Byron Bolton gave on the witness stand was only what Ziegler told Bolton. And we all know that Ziegler is dead. So who's to say that he told Bolton? Mr. Barker knew that he was hunted by the government because they always go after a man who served a prior term in prison, as he did. And I want to tell you that when the government is after a man, you can't blame him for wanting to keep out of their way. He was afraid that he wouldn't get a fair trial. And sometimes I think that's right. <clears throat> the fingerprint testimony of government expert Aaron Cohn hinges entirely on his so-called 14 points of comparison. Now, the government agents brought in on this case are all very nice men. Here we have District Attorney Sullivan holding a political position. You mean I'm politically active? I mean you hold your position as a matter of political appointment. It might be more fair to say that you hold your job at the sufferance of politicians or get the ax. Your Honor, I object. That's no way to the truth, Mr. Solomon. How do you think we are in this course? Counsel, I will maintain order in this courtroom. Each of you must be mindful of your obligations of lawyers as lawyers, and you must be mindful of the limits and the propriety of all of your conduct here. 
Now, subject to that, I'll permit you to continue, Mr. DeCurse. Thank you. I'm not asking the jury to have sympathy on my behalf because Mr. Barker doesn't ask for sympathy, only justice based on the evidence produced on the witness stand. You as a jury, an American jury, must not feel that you owe the government any more than you do the defendants. You're only here to listen to the evidence, the arguments, and the charge of the court, and make your decision fairly and justly. I've known Ed Bramer for 20 years. The first man I met upon coming to St. Paul was the beloved and revered Adolf Bramer, father of the kidnapped man. And standing here before you today, and speaking for Mr. Barker, I make no apologies. You've seen the man. You've learned about his history, and you know that he's not the brightest man. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, the jury, look at him, you must come to the conclusion that he's a simple, trusting, reliable soul. <laughs> <laughs> the story you have seen is true, although the actual trial lasted five weeks and involved many more defendants and dozens of government witnesses. Winona Burnett testified in several other gangster trials and served six months in the Federal Women's Reformatory in Milan, Michigan. She disappeared shortly after her release. Byron Bolton was sentenced to three years. He, too, was called upon to testify at numerous other gangster trials and was released in 1938. He lived another 40 years and died in California. Jimmy Wilson served five years in El Reno, Oklahoma Federal Reformatory. It is not known whether he ever became a doctor. <laughs> Arthur Doc Barker received the maximum sentence allowed under the Lindbergh Law. Life in prison in the escape-proof Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary. He was joined by fellow gang members Volney Davis, Bill Weaver, and Harry Sawyer. Doc Barker served three years before being shot and killed while attempting to escape. Public enemy number one, Alvin Carpus, was the last gang member to be captured a year after the Barker trial, when he was finally tracked down by relentless federal agents. J. Edgar Hoover claimed to have personally handcuffed the infamous criminal mastermind. Carpus was convicted in St. Paul and sentenced to a life in prison at Alcatraz where he refused to take part in Doc Barker's failed escape attempt. After serving the longest time of any convict on the Rock, 26 years, he was finally transferred to McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary. Alvin Carpus served 33 years behind bars for his life of crime. He was released in 1969 and eventually settled in Spain, where he died in his sleep 10 years later at the age of 71. He wrote two books about his criminal career and life in prison, and starred in a Canadian documentary about his gangster days. In interviews with the press, Alvin Carpus had a single message for the public. Crime does not pay. 